Broadcasting from Manhattan Beach and the World Wide Web, you're listening to CHSR, HealthyLife.net. As a service to our listeners, this program is for general information and entertainment purposes only. CHSR HealthyLife.net does not recommend, endorse, or object to the views, products, or topics expressed or discussed by show hosts or their guests. We suggest you always consult with your own personal, medical, financial, or legal advisor. Welcome to the How to Love Show with Dr. Mike. It's great to have you. Hope you're having a good week so far. Um, we have with us today uh, a guest, uh, Stacy Chalemi, talking about personal challenges to spiritual awakening. And as you know, awakening is, is, is you may know that awakening is a really pr- profound uh, experience that can really uh, catapult our capacity to love. So, Stacy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I am very excited to speak with you, and I look forward to our conversation. Great. Well, I, me too. It's wonderful to have you. Um, tell, tell our audience a little bit about yourself. Well, I am um, I'm very uh, – I have the website, The Complete Herbal Guide, and I do a lot of work with people on trying to uh, make – um, changes in their lifestyle to improve their mental, physical, and spiritual um, uh, uh, well-being. And uh, I, you know, I work with people because um, what I believe is, is that, you know, there always is a root cause to everything. And if we make uh, small adjustments and changes in our lives, we can do uh, sometimes the littlest changes can actually have the biggest outcomes. That's a really wise. Yeah, little changes at a time add up over time, don't they? Oh, they do very much so. Yeah, very much so. I take it you've had uh, some experiences with spiritual awakening. Is that true? Yes. You know, I, my life was a little bit of a roller coaster ride. You know, at the age of five, um, my parents had walked in my room one day and they saw me in my bed. I was turning blue and my eyes were rolled back. And I was in a grandma seizure. Um, I was rushed to the hospital, and while I was there, I was induced in a four-day coma. Uh, they didn't think um, that uh, I was going to have a, a very uh, good uh, outcome. They had uh, mentioned to my parents that if I do come out of this coma, I would probably be paraplegic or I would have severe brain damage. And um, you know, I was very lucky. Um, I when I came out of the coma, I didn't. Ha- I wasn't paraplegic and I didn't have brain damage. Damage, but I was left with epilepsy. I had a virus called encephalitis that had traveled throughout my brain, and to this day, it left scar tissue damage in my brain. But they can't detect where, um, you know. So throughout my entire life, I had seizures of all kinds, and um, I struggled to try to, you know, work through um, my epilepsy and to try to live a so-called normal life as best as I could. Um, you know, it was very difficult. Um, you know, my uh, seizures had um, were uh, controlled for a while through medication, and then when I had went through my menstrual cycles as a young lady, um, my seizures started back up again. And um, going through life um, in school, especially college, was very difficult. I had uh, struggled trying to get through college, and the stresses of college, studying, uh, the late night, um, you know, gatherings with your friends, all these things, uh, you know, uh, helped, uh, you know, in- encourage more seizures to come about. And um, I just, you know, I didn't know how I was going to get through it. I said, you know, what am I going to do? If I'm going to have these seizures consistently throughout my life, how am I going to live a normal, healthy, and productive lifestyle and and be able to accomplish all the goals I had set for myself? And um, I had written an article into the Epilepsy Foundation. They have a magazine that they publish on a monthly basis. And I asked them to please publish the article, and I asked people, how do they cope with epilepsy? How do they, you know, actually, um, you know, live life, and how are they able to get through each day? Uh, and uh, I was very surprised that I got over three to 400 letters throughout the United States and Canada. People were sharing their stories and sharing advice and, and teaching me different tools and techniques that I could actually use to myself. And, you know, um, at that moment, um, I was just stunned. 
you know, it was very supportive, very motivational, and I realized that, you know, I wasn't the only one, um, you know, I wasn't alone, it, and there were many other people with this disorder, and, um, you know, so I, I continued to go through life, I graduated um, college, and then I actually started, and I worked for a very big corporation in New York, and, um, I actually, uh, one day I had fell to the floor, I had a grand mal seizure, and a uh, producer had walked over me, and he saw me having the seizure, and he just kept walking, and, you know, it wasn't too long after that that I was, uh, a, a associate had came up to me and said, I'm sorry, but you don't really fit the, 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 uh, the actual um, uh, th things that we're looking for. Um, and so I knew it was because of the seizure. And uh, so I just, you know, I didn't let it get to me, and I kept moving on, and uh, I wasn't going to let it. Uh, that was discrimination, what they did, no? Yeah, you know, it was. And, and I spoke to the Epilepsy Foundation, and they actually had me go to Congress, and I spoke on, I spoke on job discrimination. But back then, you know, things were a lot different than they were today. And, uh, you know, it wasn't until, you know, um, the, the last... Uh, decade or two, they really started putting a stand on on job discrimination. But a little before that, you know, um, you could actually, you know, people could get away with things that they can't get away with today. And to be honest with you, I just, you know, I I was very disappointed. I was upset, but I, you know, I also realized that, you know, the world isn't such a nice place, and maybe this isn't for me. So I kept moving, and I didn't, I didn't um, make a big deal out of it. I probably could have, but I didn't. And um, I just, uh, I decided, I, I, I thought to myself, this is not what I was meant to be. This is not what I was meant to do. There's something out there, you know, because, uh, you know, I just felt there, there was something there in life, um, a passion that, you know, and a, a destination that was waiting for me. And I didn't feel it in, in it, what I was doing at that time. So I kept moving on, and I started working and doing and writing and working for an herbalist. And uh, I actually found, um, I actually started writing um, and doing a lot of research in natural healing. And uh, I was uh, doing a lot of research in different um, uh, herbs and different uh, natural natural uh, alternatives on how to heal the body. And I actually was really stunned of all the different things uh, that you could do yourself um, to heal yourself. And I started applying a lot of those tools and techniques to my own life. And, you know, suddenly my seizures got better. My seizures went from nine seizures a month to, to six to five to four to three to two. And, and I started feeling terrific. And my energy level started getting better. My focus started getting better, um, you know. And I actually, you know, uh, started, you know, really understanding that, you know, life, uh, you know, if we change our, our lifestyle, and our, our, you know, we could actually change, you know, um, a lot of, and fix a lot of the problems in our lives. And people sometimes don't realize, but there's a root cause to everything. And, you know, when we have problems or we have an illness or a condition, um, there is a root cause. And if we dig deep into ourselves to find out what's actually going on, what's causing these problems, we could actually make small adjustments uh, to our lives and make changes and not, you know, and some, it doesn't happen overnight, but you could actually help yourself. And there's ways to improve your life and improve your, 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 your goals and your futures, you know, because the past is the past. We can't change the past, but yeah. we can focus on the present. And if we focus Absolutely. on the present and we, you know, we create um, goals, short-term and long-term goals, and we figure out ways on how to move forward in life, we can actually create a very productive future for ourselves. So good. So, yeah, I, I, you know, I, that's wonderful. I'm so happy for you, Stacey, that you've been able to sort of come out of this. It's really, really wonderful. I know that, we, we had, um, that when Dana set up our call, it was going to be to talk about sort of spiritual awakening. Is that something that you, you, in the time that we have left, that you want to mention or talk about what role that played in I, I did have a spiritual awakening, you know. I realized that, you know, um, in order to move forward in life, you, you really, you know, sometimes you have to hit rock bottom. 
Um, and, and when I was going through this little roller coaster ride, um, there was a point where I was in denial. I didn't want to, you know, face who I was. I didn't like who I was. I was really, you know, um, not happy with myself and my life and the way things were turning out. And it got to a point where I had to actually hit rock bottom and actually realize that I needed to start um, accepting myself for who I was. And I was a person with epilepsy. And there are many people that, you know, that have illnesses and conditions and problems and they resort to alcohol or drugs or dep they fall into depression or they commit suicide. And I wasn't going to be one of those people. And I refused to, to you know, to, to, to fall down, you know, completely. I was going to get back up. And, um, you know, I learned that you have to really learn to, to love who you are and like I said, first you have to really accept who you are, and then you have to love yourself. How did you get to the point of accepting yourself? You know, I, I started writing journals. I started letting out my emotions. I actually got together in groups of people, and we spoke, you know, about our own instances in life. And we actually, you know, shared a lot of emotion and, and a lot of um, a lot of stories. And you realize that you're not the only one in life. That you know, we all, sometimes we we fall into 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 you know holes, and you know we don't realize that there are so many people out there just like us. And, you so know, when you realized that you weren't alone and that there were people just like you and you shared your, the truth of your story with them and they shared their stories with you, you, you felt a sense of their connect, acceptance of you and a sense of, through that, your own acceptance of yourself? Is that is that right? Yes, exactly. You know, and you know, and it also, you know, by listening to each other and by having people there, you know, having we had like a, a group counselors, you know, speaking with us and you know, showing us, you know, tools and different techniques. And when you get to a point where, you know, you you share these stories and and you um you you start to realize that you're not alone and people you start to learn how well how did you get you know how did you get to this point. And how did you get to that point? And then learning different tools and techniques, um, you know, uh, to help you in the future, you know, when you, um, to, you know, because emotions can, you know, your emotions can really destroy you if you don't know how to deal with your emotions. A lot of times people don't know how to deal with their emotions, so they push it down and they push it down. And then, you know, they, they don't want to feel these emotions. So then they resort to other things to hide the emotions so they don't have to feel it. Some people become like a, 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 a numb, uh, you know, they're just, they just walk around and they, they just don't really refuse to, to feel anything. And they live life, um, some live life in denial, some live life in anger, you know. And once you start expressing your emotion and you have other people expressing their emotion and you start sharing and it's like a waterfall and then those emotions come out. It's like a release, uh, you know, and, and you, you actually were able to share with other people who understood you, and then you learn, you learn techniques on how, when you get to points in your life where you just feel overwhelmed with emotions and things that's happened in your life, how to cope with them, strategies to move on in life, because in life, there's always going to be a problem. Life is full of problems. We wake up every day, and life is full of surprises. You know, and uh, you you never know what the next day is going to bring. So you have to really learn how to deal with life, how to deal cope with stress, and even stress itself. Ninety percent of illnesses are stress related. So stress can destroy you. But if you learn how to cope with stress, and you learn how to deal with your emotions, and you learn how to how to deal with things and then move on, you could do you could do so much with yourself. So I, yeah, I, I, think, I think the problem is, is that for for so many people who are listening, um, you know, people say, well, co you know, deal with your emotions or cope with stress. But I, and a lot of people don't really know. Well, what do I actually do? And one thing that you've expressed, I think, that I would just want to reflect for our audience, Stacey, is that you were able to cope with your emotions and, and deal with your pain. Uh, by connecting with other supportive people yeah. and then saying the truth to yourself and to others of what was really going on for you 
uh, with the acceptant, loving, supportive people there to hear it and mirror it back to you. Oh, yes. You know, when you have people that um, can be supportive and can be there for you and understand you and, you know, um, you know, because a lot of times things even resort to our childhood. People don't realize it, but from the moment we're born and, and our childhood years, things that happen, you know, affect us throughout the years, and it, it builds us into the people that we are now. And a lot of times when you look back, you have a lot of the same qualities you have as, have as a child. And sometimes things happen in people's lives in, you know, that might not be so good, and they don't know how to deal with it. And they just, you know, as a child, they might, they might push it down, and then it keeps building as they grow up and as they become young adults. And then they're not able to, they weren't able to cope as a child, they're not able to cope as an adult. So well, you know, it's really interesting, the pain of trauma and abuse or that we experience or neglect, in your case, very traumatic seizure disorder. Um, the pain of those things, children, by nature's design, kind of have to necessarily deny and push that stuff away to survive. And I think that as we get older, you're right, that pain haunts us, and we've learned to push it all away, which obviously... If you can't feel it, you can't heal it. And right. we, we learn to serve by, by feeling the pain rather than feeling the pain. But now we have to stop feeling it, and we have to face and embrace and feel it if we want to heal it. And I hear that very much in, in the message you're giving to all of us. Yes, and, you know, that's why so much, because I do a lot of, I, I, you know, you had mentioned to me that you do a lot of things, um, you know, you do a lot of helpful things to help people with addiction. And, you know, so many people go into addiction because they try to numb those pains, and it doesn't feel as severe, and they don't have to cope with it if they're under the influence. And, you yeah. know, and uh, it's an escape you know, but the thing is, is that you either, you know, you end up killing yourself through your addiction or you end up destroying your life or, you know, you, you know, I, I've known people that their, 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 their liver has, has died on them because of the alcoholism or people. You know, I once done... read something um, last, it was last, actually two weeks ago, I, I've been reading a great book on, on, on acceptance commitment therapy. And uh, one of the statements that the authors, there's about five authors to this book, um, and they make a profound statement, Stacey, that uh, they say that the bulk of human suffering is rooted, rooted in avoidance of our pain. Yeah. Uh, that is profound. And you're right. I mean, in my work with patients, and as you've done, I, I think there's so much of a need to create a way to – to be with and tolerate uh, and, and metabolize and process our pain. Yeah. Uh, no. It's so important. It is so important. And you know what I even noticed, too, is that even some people, um, you know, they grew up in, in generations where they were told that they were not supposed to tell anybody that because they're different or because their life is not a normal life, they, they can't tell anybody. Like, for instance, for even with epilepsy, epilepsy in, in Hawaii was considered a curse. You couldn't tell anybody because it was, you were, you It was know, a shame, were, right? It was a shame. And then many, many people are ashamed, you know, and even the parents yeah. sometimes don't know how to cope with it. So even with, when you speak of alcoholism and you speak of, um, or dysfunctionalism, people sometimes just don't know how to handle it. And some people, even the parents or the grandparents or the family members, everyone's in denial because everyone just doesn't know how to deal with it or doesn't want to deal with it or is overwhelmed themselves with the stressful situation. And, you know, yeah. and, it, and if people don't get help, then the, the behaviors, you know, they travel from generation to generation because then they have children, you know, if they get married, and then their behavior, their negative behavior falls off on the child, and the child sees this behavior, and they think it's normal, and they pick up patterns of this behavior, and it just follows from generation to generation, and it just, you know, it, it's something when, when people have problems and they feel and they know that their life um, isn't, isn't the way it should be, they should reach out to other people, and they, you know, and if they're embarrassed to speak in groups, I, you know, one-on-one -on -one therapy is excellent itself. That's a great way to to 
to um, to to work through problems. As, you know, if, if you know, because some people are very embarrassed to 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 admit to their problems or to admit to their emotions. You know, but when you do, when you finally do realize that there are other people just like you, you feel a little bit more comfortable to open up. But sometimes people have to really, you know, they have to get to that point, you know, and just talking to somebody one on one might be the step one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so naming the truth, talking the truth, getting the support of others, and, and then learning how to manage our pain. Another thing I want to just point out, Stacey, that you mentioned is how toxic uh, sort of it's crazy that, that we feel ashamed of the things that cause us pain. And we even learn to have shame for our pain, which is just ridiculous, uh, that we are bad because we feel bad. I know it's... It's so irrational, but so many people feel bad about themselves because they feel bad. And I just think the honor and the, and, and sort of a, uh, move beyond, had the courage to move beyond that shame to sort of radical acceptance of ourselves exactly as we are with whatever it ha- that we happen to be feeling and honoring that and letting go of shame is so important to be able to do this pain work, don't you? Oh, definitely. You know, in our society, you know, I was on several advisory boards and we were talking about this issue. And and one of the biggest things is that our society has painted a stigmatism of what society, a perfect society, is supposed to look like. You know, um, we're our our lot, you know, like for instance, the Brady Bunch, you know, those people behind stage had the most dysfunctional lives, you know, but on stage, on camera, they had the perfect painted life. And, you know, people sometimes what they see is, is what they think is real. And, you know, life isn't like that. You know, there, there, I, I don't like the word perfect because there is no such thing. You know, nothing in life is perfect. We all have, you know, we all have problems. There's always nothing is perfect in life. And, um, you know, people have to realize that they shouldn't be ashamed. There's no need to be ashamed. There's n- nobody in this life is perfect. Everybody has something. So, you know, to, to be ashamed of who you are, it, you shouldn't. Because I guarantee you, if you were in a group of people and you started talking about a problem in your life and you said, does anyone have this or does anyone feel like this, I guarantee you at least two people will raise their hand. Yeah, yeah. No, so true. I was talking this morning with with my mentor, um, uh, just a wonderful, wonderful woman, um, and um, we were talking about my own sort of feeling of just pain and regret over mistakes I've made and 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 people that I've hurt. You know, particularly my ex-wife and my and my two sons, um, just inadvertently to some degree, usually, and uh, and just how how. When we make mistakes, um, there, you know, to add on to what you're saying, there, there's such a need to understand that we all make mistakes. And oh yes. We all are imperfect. My wife, my wife Linda, likes to say, "Perfection is imperfect, and imperfection is perfect." <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So no. We should no blame, no shame. No blame, no shame. Yes, yeah. you know, it's you know we have to all realize that you know everybody makes mistakes in life. But the 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 goal is when we make mistakes to learn from them and then to make changes and then to move on. So if you realize your mistake and you actually you know make some short term and long term goals to make sure you don't make the same mistake again and move on you know the fact that you made the effort to try to solve the issue so it doesn't happen again that's that's a kudos to you you know and and even even if you try to solve the mistake and you may not get to the point in life where you want to be you still made the effort and that's all that matters is that you tried to better yourself and that's all you need to do. As long as you take a moment in your life to try to make something better in your life, the effort is, is, is you know, you cannot fail when you try. I don't believe you can fail. You know, you may not you know, get there's to there's something the very level. redemptive about there, isn't it? Isn't yeah. It? Uh, it's very redemptive. I say to my patients and to myself, we got to name it, we got to claim it, 
and then we, in order to tame it. And if we want to tame it, we can't shame it. So name it, claim it, tame it, don't shame it. <laughs> right. <laughs> I like that. So, yeah. But you're right. If you if you do that and you own it, you name it, claim it, and you, you really work to sort of learn and, 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 and change your behavior now because of hurtful or, or, or unskillful behavior in the past, that's highly, highly redemptive um, and uh, can allow you, you know, what I say, I, I work a lot with people who, um, in a prison hospital, who who have murdered and who have uh, raped and, 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 mm-hmm. and molested children and, and, and done all sorts of really unskillful, really destructive things, and who now really live with terrible, terrible, sh- many of them, not all of them, but many of them with just life-crippling shame and guilt. And they can't go back and change uh, what they did. Uh, but it really is what you said, Stacey, is so helpful to, to you know, that we, we can learn from that and we can try and, and make living amends and, and live this day with love and integrity as best we can. Yes, you know, as long as you you make the effort to better yourself, that that's all that matters, you know. And and you know, you know, and for people who are religious, you know, when when it comes to you know the redemption of sins or it comes to forgiving ourselves, I think the biggest thing is is forgiving ourselves. That's the that's the thing, you know. Um, you know, I believe if we try to if we forgive ourselves then we will be able to move on and better ourselves. It's the guilt that you hold inside for the mistakes we make in life is mm-hmm. that what holds you down in that hole. And, but you need to forgive yourself because we are human and we do make mistakes, and sometimes we may not always make the right choices. But if we forgive ourselves and then we make the effort to change and then we move forward after that, then life, you know, then, then you're on the right track and then you, you, sh- you are a good person. You know, a, a person who, who does those things, if they forgive themselves and then they make changes to better themselves and they move on and they try to make changes for the future and maybe to help others, you know, because they made mistakes, they hurt others in the past, but now they're helping others. That's a A to Z. And they need yeah, to realize beautiful. that that, that they made a huge, a huge change in life, mm. and then they need to give themselves a pat on the back. Oh, Stacy. Well, we're out of time, but I just want to say I really appreciate your your wisdom. I appreciate your 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 loving energy, um, and really appreciate uh, how far you evolved and come in your own life, and and what good you're doing for the world. Uh, uh, for folks who are listening, we're listening to Stacy uh, Chalemi, and she has a website called thecompleteherbalguide.com, and also stacychalemi.com, c h i l l e m i dot com. Uh, well, Stacy, I want to thank you very much for being on the show, and want to wish you well, both personally and also in your professional work going forward. Thank you for being with us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's been a, a wonderful experience talking to you, Dr. Mike, and I enjoyed our, our session together speaking about all these different topics. Oh, it's so good. Thank you. You listen to the How to Love Show with Dr. Mike. Stay tuned. I'll be right back after this break. Go to HowToLove.com to access wisdom on how to lead a life of love. You'll find articles, blogs, media, and lots more, all to help you learn how to love and let love into your life. If loving and being loved is challenging for you, know that you can learn to love and be loved. Learn more at HowToLove.com. You'll even discover information about Dr. Mike McGee and how he can personally guide you to a life of love and even how to get him to speak at your function or group. Visit HowToLove.com. Go there now. HowToLove.com 101 Things to Know If You Are Addicted to Painkillers is a new book by Dr. Michael McGee. In this book, Dr. McGee, an addiction psychiatrist, offers helpful information that leads you through all phases of recovery. 101 Things to Know If You Are Addicted to Painkillers helps you know that you can heal and be addiction-free. Get 101 Things to Know If You Are Addicted to Painkillers at Amazon.com. 
This is exciting, so listen up. Now you can sign up for Dr. McGee's live online seminar support group so you can learn how to love. You'll share your challenges about loving with others and get the guidance and support you need to heal your love wounds at the same time. Join Dr. McGee and others in healing and learning to love skillfully. Now you can get professional support for only $25 to help you realize the fulfillment of loving and being loved. How great is that? Call 805-459-8232 to learn more. Love is limitless and Dr. Mike McGee, an experienced love coach, can help you to tap into this limitless source of love even if you feel unloving or unlovable. If love has left you wounded, neglected, traumatized, then you can go to howtolove.com and join Dr. McGee's community to help heal your love wound. Or you can call Dr. Mike McGee and he can personally help you using a wonderful awakening approach to become someone who can give and receive love. Call now at 805-459-8232. Shh, over here. Here's a secret for a virus-free computer. ESET, they've been a pioneer in the antivirus industry for over 25 years. 25 years of innovative, top-rated antivirus protection. ESET's award-winning security solutions provide a safe online experience for over 100 million home and business computer owners. They are so affordable, fast, and simple to use. So be gone, you blue screen of death. ESET's on my computer. If it's not on yours, visit HealthyLife.net's advertiser page and click on ESET now. Expanding your mind. HealthyLife.net. Welcome back to the How to Love Show, Dr. Mike. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, spiritual awakening and uh, what that is in terms of its relationship uh, to, to love. Um, there, are, there are different uh, qualities of spiritual awakening. People talk about spiritual awakenings all the time uh, and from all sorts of different religions and faiths. And what's really extraordinary about people who study and research these is that they, um, they, they have um, – a lot of the um, the, uh, the same qualities that are kind of um, uh, universal, um, no matter you know where in the world you are, um, you know where where um, where you've um, where where you you've grown up, what 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 kind of um, what kind of uh, childhood you've had, what kind of beliefs you've been given. Um, there there's uh, some universality. And there's several different characteristics. Probably the most common characteristic is a feeling of oneness and stillness. Um, this is kind of a uh, a perceptual experience. Uh, there's an intensification of perception where there's a sort of a sense of openness and freshness and clarity. What some people call present presentness or timelessness. There's a pervasive spiritual energy that is experienced and aliveness. Uh, sometimes a, a perceptual experience of harmony or oneness or what some people call non-duality. Uh, there can be a perception of a sacred life force that or flows through everything. Some people, not everybody, but will have an experience of sort of a sense of a loving other or a, a loving energy. But, again, the sort of unique thing of oneness, a perception of oneness, that uh, a, a sort of a, a breakdown of what all spiritual traditions sort of talk about of this dualism or this separation of a sense of self and other that tends to, to go away. Um, and it sort of counters what the ego does. I mean, the ego has been very skill, successful at, at helping us to survive and create a civilization, but it's come at a price. Uh, and with the ego, there's sort of a de-intensification of perception because the ego serves as a filter so that we can just focus on what, what the ego, what the brain determines to be most important for our survival. And there's sort of an automis, what's called automization or sort of an auto, automaticness to what we perceive. Uh, and we tend to sort of uh, uh, perceive things in abstract ways in terms of con, concepts and to experience ourselves as separate. And this perceptual awakening or uh, to oneness is sort of counters those ego functions, it's sort of a transcendence of those ego functions. So that's the first universal quality of awakening. It's a sort of experience of oneness. 
Uh, the second is an emotional experience, and that emotional experience is one of peace. It's an experience of an inner quietness and stillness. Uh, it, it's sort of a retrieval, uh, because of the retrieval of awareness from immersion and thought, and this experience of oneness, what, what comes with that is a feeling of peace and well-being, oftentimes. It's not always, but a feeling generally that all is well and all will, all will be well. There's a, a, degree, a decreased sense of fear of death. Uh, there's an increased sense of energy and equanimity. Uh, oftentimes people will describe experiences of bliss and joy. Uh, and this really uh, it comes from this countering of the egoic experience of separation and disconnection. Um, so this, this feeling of peace and well-being counters the ego's experience of insecurity and turmoil and loneliness. Um, so that's the emotional piece of, uh, of peace and stillness. The third is the, is the conceptual. So there's the perceptual of oneness, the emotional of peace, and then the conceptual, which is sort of a feeling of a lack of group identity or, or a conceptual outlook that we are all part of one internet, interconnected web of life. There's one human family. Uh, it, it's not us versus them. That kind of goes away, you know, those, those, um, those terrible Russians or those terrible Chinese or those terrible people over there, uh, those whatever, uh, you know, the kind of feelings that you get with nationalism and racism, that kind of sense of the, the bad other uh, versus the good us. When you have a spiritual awakening experience, that kind of sense of us versus them, I'm good, you're bad, that kind of goes away. Um, there's just less egocentricity um, uh, and, and less of a sense of self-concern and self-seeking. Uh, there's just more of this conceptual understanding that we are all one. It comes from the experience that we are all one. So that's conceptual. <clears throat> the fourth quality of, of, of a spiritual awakening is one of altruism, which, again, I think springs from that, that experience of, of, of of oneness and a sort of a sense of reverence for uh, the one life of which we are all a part, a tiny part of. The, out, out of that comes a wish to do good, a wish to help, a wish to love, a wish to serve. Um, there's the people who have, are, have had significant spiritual awakening experiences, according to the research that's been done on this, uh, tend to be more engaged. Um, they tend to be less materialistic. Uh, not so much attached to things like status or power or prestige. There's a shift from a focus on self-centeredness to uh, sort of what I call um, uh, sort of a uh, from from me go to we go. <laughs> There's a sense of moving from a, a, a self-centered point of view to more of a you might want to call it a unicentric or omnicentric point of view, where there's basically a concern for the one, for all of us. Um, uh, and, and I think people, because of their awakening experiences, then tend to be more loving. They tend to be more authentic, more compassionate. Uh, there's also a sense of a relinquishment of personal agency. There's not too much of a sense that I'm doing this it's more of a sense of uh, this is happening through me. So this, this sense of altruism uh, that, that arises from the experience of oneness and, and, and goodness, um, uh, of an awakening experience, oneness and goodness, uh, really counters sort of the ego strives to accumulate. You know, he who dies with the most toys wins. Uh, more of a, uh, less of that sense of attachment that things need to be just the way I want them to be or I will be unhappy, that kind of goes away. And there's less of a focus on sort of uh, excessive consumption uh, because you're not in need for that. Um, there's less inauthenticity, less of a need to sort of fit in um, to meet, to sort of garner other people's conditional approval. Uh, there's more of a sense of belonging, 
that's more unconditional. Also, a judgment tends to go away, you know, uh, which is kind of a, a psychologically violent act to sort of say you're bad because you do this, this, and this, or you believe that, that, and that. So judgment and, and negativity and aversion, uh, hatred, those kinds of feelings kind of reside when we've had these awakening experiences. And then there's less conflict, more harmony in relationships, out of the sense of altruism. Um, and there's less manipulation. And, and there's a really good literature to show that people who've had spiritual awakening experiences um, are, are really uh, oftentimes are their, their addictions, if they have addictions or suffer from addictions, or just sort of long-term destructive compulsive behaviors, that there's sort of an easing of those, those addictions. And many people have attributed spiritual awakening experiences uh, to their recovery. So um, really, uh, it, you know, these kinds of awakening experiences are, are not something that you can decide to do. You can't ego an awakening, uh, but uh, you can do things to nurture an awakening experience. And um, uh, those are uh, really the, the three A's of awakening that, that I uh, will talk about in the next segment really have to do do with that. And um, uh, those are to, um, to really um, focus on uh, uh, really living a, a life that involves some stillness, some uh, 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 acting uh, in spiritual contemplation of some sort, prayer and meditation, and then living a life of integrity, uh, a life of no harm. Um, and then um, purifying, purifying our motivations, really transforming from uh, a life that's driven by wanting uh, and desire, a life that is is really uh, uh, a desire to, to love and to, to benefit not only ourselves but, but everyone and ourselves as part of everyone. And then there's sort of a renunciation or, or really letting go of psychological attachments to social status, material goods, wealth, power, the affection of others, uh, and really a renunciation of, self, of compulsive self-seeking, and then engaging in a life of service, altruism, giving, putting others first. And then, as I mentioned, sort of stillness and contemplative practices. That can include reading and journaling. Of spending time in nature. Um, these practices, if they're engaged in over time, steadily and consistently, lead for most people to a very gradual awakening. And as we awaken, as, as we now understand spiritual awakening, we see that we uh, experience more joy, more peace, and more of a loving and fulfilling life. Get ready to be addiction-free. This number one best-selling, multi-award winning guide is what you've been waiting for. With his book, The Joy of Recovery, the Harvard-trained Dr. Michael McGee has helped hundreds of patients to full recovery. Imagine transforming your life with The Joy of Recovery's unique 12-step program. Take the first steps to overcome your obstacles now by getting The Joy of Recovery available at Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Learn more at thejoyofrecovery.com. Authentic love is universal and unconditional. It is love for both the lovable and unlovable, liberated from toxic ego judgments that reduce and dehumanize. When you deeply understand the forces that drove others to hurt you and you to hurt others, compassion and forgiveness will allow love and bring you joy. Now on HowToLove.com, you can learn more about the liberation of loving with Dr. Mike McGee's eBooks on joy, love, and recovery. And there's more eBooks on the way. So visit HowToLove.com and put a little joy in your life. No matter your faults, flaws, and failures, know that you are of immeasurable worth. You deserve to exist and to be happy just like everyone else. No matter what you have done, no matter how others might judge you, you are still sacred and lovable. Learn more at HowToLove.com. When you get there, you'll find a wonderful healing blog that discusses all aspects of love, like awakening, recovery, transformation, spirituality, and more. Open up to endless love. Visit howtolove.com right now.
Go to HowToLove.com to access wisdom on how to lead a life of love. You'll find articles, blogs, media, and lots more, all to help you learn how to love and let love into your life. If loving and being loved is challenging for you, know that you can learn to love and be loved. Learn more at HowToLove.com. You'll even discover information about Dr. Mike McGee and how he can personally guide you to a life of love and even how to get him to speak at your function or group. Visit HowToLove.com. Go there now. HowToLove.com. Reach your health and fitness goals. Whether you want to lose weight, learn to dance, build muscle, or just live healthy, Beachbody gives you unlimited access to the nation's most popular fitness and weight loss solutions. Visit our advertiser page and click on Beachbody now. The Bright Side of Talk, HealthyLife.net. Welcome back to the How to Love Show with Dr. Mike. Um, I, I, you know, there is so much pain and suffering in the world, uh, and so many people have uh, not learned how to uh, safely and effectively love and be loved because of trauma and neglect. Um, if that's the case for you, know that you're not alone. Uh, many people struggle with a love de- deficit, and actually I think it's getting worse. There's been an increase in suicide rate by a whopping 35% over the past 20 years. Uh, somebody in despair takes their life roughly every 10 minutes. Um, and many who suffer suicide are it's driven in part underlying by loneliness, uh, which almost half of all Americans experience. As a society, we are becoming more and more alienated. People's social networks have diminished by more than a third from 1985 to 2009. Uh, The percentage of people living alone has increased 40% in recent years. And even for those who are married, the joy of of love is sometimes elusive. Various studies have found that about three out of four people, married people are unhappy with their marriages, with roughly 50% of all marriages ending in divorce. So why are so many people impaired in their capacity to love? There's three main reasons, trauma, neglect, and a lack of belonging to a loving community. Research suggests that fully 40% of people experience abuse or neglect in their childhood. To learn to love, you need to feel safe and cared for and have a lovingly connected family and tribe. Far too many of us were never taught how to properly love. Fortunately, we can all heal from our love deficit disorders. Even if you don't have a love deficit disorder, though, through practice, you can become even a more loving person. So let's talk about how we develop our capacity to love. To start, think about love as having two parts. One is an attitude of reverence for life, reverence that inspires the second part of love, which is acting to benefit yourself and others. So loving starts with a cultivating reverence. Reverence counters hatred and fear, apathy and self-centeredness. When you have reverence for yourself and others, it's natural to want to be loving. So what we need to practice to cultivate reverence uh, followed by loving action, what do we need to do? Let me share with you three simple steps uh, to practice for learning to love. And they're going to maybe sound a little counterintuitive, uh, but I'll explain. The first practice is distilled from a large body of research on the benefits of mindfulness, loving kindness, meditation, self-compassion, and three particular therapies, dialectical behavioral therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, and interpersonal psychotherapy. And I call this practice the three A's of awakening to love. And the three A's are attending, appreciating, and acting with love. And you cultivate reverence by combining the practices of attending and appreciating. This is called the practice of appreciative attending. So let's first talk about attending. Attending means looking closely at the way things are. This includes attending to the now and attending carefully to causes and consequences. You practice attending through inquiry, contemplation, silent prayer, meditation, and mindfulness. In all of these, you ask yourself moment by moment, what is this? Attending cultivates insight and wisdom because when you look long enough, you eventually see. One thing you see is that, and when you attend, is that are the past conditions that led to this moment. Attending fosters understanding. 
when you understand why people acted the way they did, you experience compassion and forgiveness for them. For me, attending carefully to my childhood allowed me to see that my parents are really good, wonderful people, but like all of us, we have our challenges. I saw that the harm, the, the, the harm that I suffered growing up was due in part to limitations and difficult circumstances, not entirely of my parents' cho choosing. I see now that our faults are not our fault, even though we are ultimately responsible for managing our faults. This is a profound and liberating insight. As I think about others who have harmed me and the forces that caused them to act as they did, I see hurt and anger and fear, some of which I may have triggered, and a lack of understanding on their parts. Seeing this softens my heart towards them. Attending also helps for self-compassion. When you look, you see that you, like everyone else, yearns for safety, comfort, and belonging. You see that your ego can drive you out of fear to be self-centered and hurtful. Attending helps you to see that we all struggle to manage our ego that too often manages us. Attending helps you to see that we are only human, just trying to get by the best we can. When you look and see your wounds, you feel compassion for your wounds. Attending is thus an antidote to self-hatred. When you attend, you not only inquire into causes and consequences, you also attend to the workings of the mind. You do this in silent stillness of prayer or meditation. As you attend to your mind, you notice two things. First, you notice you're, that you're not your thoughts and feelings or urges. While there may be pain, you are not your pain. What a relief it is to take refuge from thought chatter and painful emotions and not take yourself personally. Attending truly does give you the peace of mind. As I look at my mind, I, I tend to see uh, my mind having anxious and self-critical thoughts. Mindfulness has gradually allowed me to see that I am not my anxiety, nor am I my self-condemnations. I see that the stories my, main, my mind makes up about myself and others aren't necessarily true. Attending has created a crucible of awareness that can hold my anxiety and, uh, and painful feelings and negative thoughts. Second, when you attend to mind, you notice that there is a force of goodness within all of us beyond mind that is our deeper, true nature. The experience of pure awareness or consciousness is essentially one of compassion. You experience your still aware wholeness beneath the experience of brokenness. You see the gracious goodness that sustains you in all of life. Finally, attending ultimately helps you to see the deeper nature of things. I once had such an experience when I was meditating by a lake. Suddenly, it was as if the obvious was revealed to me. I experienced a sacred life force flowing through me, the fish in the water, the plants and the birds, and I realized this force was about life and not just about me. I realized I was gifted with the experience of life as a tiny part of a vast web of life. This experience inspired deep gratitude and humility in me. I felt a powerful call to love, to serve this sacred life force that I still feel to this day. It is out of that calling that I'm now, you know, sharing these words with you today. So, you see, the, the attending gives rise to this profound sense of appreciation, which is the second practice. Appreciation is at, it, is at its roots a reverent attitude of awe and wonder at the miracle and mystery of consciousness and life. It is also a humble, acceptance, and worshipful attitude towards reality. Because appreciation is an attitude, it is unconditional and unchanging, uh, kind of like the still sea beneath this turbing, turbulent wave of our emotions and thoughts. When we see the extraordinary nature of the ordinary, we see that this moment is sacred. We see that we are all sacred that others are sacred, that everything is sacred. We see that every day of life is amazing. This appreciation cultivated by attending makes life fresh. It is experienced according to the truth that it is unique and unrepeatable. While you might act to make things better, you appreciate that everything in this moment is, is as it must and can only be in this moment. 
Our humble acceptance of reality creates the conditions for positive change. You see, appreciation takes the badness out of pain. Appreciation neutralizes toxic negative judgments. Uh, in part because of my own love deficit, I went through a painful divorce and lost contact with my two sons. While this has been heartbreaking, it has ultimately deepened my humility and my compassion and my forgiveness for myself and my former family. Even my, uh, my patients uh, uh, appreciate through this practice their trauma as a painful signal that they must assert and protect themselves and care for themselves. As they say, the path to wisdom is paved with suffering. Appreciation of this brings some peace amid our pain. Appreciation also counters habituation, which is a fancy word for taking things for granted. We all do this. Appreciation fosters gratitude for the goodness of our lives and the 10,000 conditions that we come together to allow us to live. They come together to allow us to live. With practice, appreciative attending cultivates loving awareness, or what I call radical reverence. There is loving awareness of goodness as well as evil, of pain, judgment, and even hatred. Appreciative attending allows us to see that all these are part of the sacred whole of things. The third practice, acting with love, naturally arises from appreciative attending. Out of reverence, there is a calling, even a mandate, to love. Living to nurture the well-being of everyone becomes our life purpose, along with savoring this precious gift of existence. Love becomes the intention behind all action. The question, what would love do, becomes your life mantra. So there are many love practices, which we'll talk about over the weeks, um, but think about these three practices. What is this? This is sacred. And what would love do? Appreciating, I mean, I'm sorry, attending, appreciating, and acting with love. These are the practices and the way to heal a love deficit disorder and enhance our capacity to love. May you be well this week. May you have a week of love and hope to have you back on our show uh, next week.